Welcome. This is the pre-recorded weekly Sabbath school class established by the Claremore Seventh-day Adventist Church in Oklahoma. The purpose is to glorify the living God through an in-depth Bible study in conjunction with the SDA Adult uh, Bible School Guide, um, which is published quarterly. My name is Mr. Dennis. Uh, I have had formal Seventh-day Adventist training through my high school and college years. Uh, I consider the writings of Ellen G. White as inspired by the living God who chose her to relay his messages. I attempt to bring fresh thoughts um, that glorify God. You are expected to be a student and not merely a tourist. Um, you are encouraged to put in the effort uh, to learn so that you may glorify the living God. I have some online uh, tools that I um, use. So in my presentation today, you too may be able to use these during your weekly study so that you can um, see and anticipate where I may be going in the uh, following week. Uh, remember, you do have in the front of your quarterly, you have the overview of the 13 uh, topics that the authors have put together for us. Um, you also have my definition of Scripture, which is God's message shared through his chosen human messenger. And the uh, Holy Bible is a collection of writings that men have determined to be inspired by God. The reason I separate those definitions is that not all Holy Bibles contain the same books. Not all Holy Bibles contain the same chapters within a book. And not all Holy Bibles contain the same verses within a particular chapter. These are things that we need to be aware of as we're selecting our uh, Bible that we wish to study from. Um, with that, let's start with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for these students who have taken the time in order to open their word, your word provided to them, and study it in order to get more about you so that we can glorify you in what we do day to day. We ask for your Holy Spirit to be with us in this study. In Jesus' name, amen. This week's study is entitled Jesus and the Apostles' View of the Bible. So the authors have put together for us um, information, and specifically they're going after uh, each, of the, each of the week's for the topic on Sunday was, it is written. It is not my intent necessarily to follow each of these pages, but we will go through uh, most of the material that was provided by the, by the author, authors. Um, for instance, they take us here to, to uh, Matthew 4, and this one in particular is, where Jesus is being led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. We have in verse 3 that the tempter said, the tempter came and said to him, if you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Now as I was looking at that, um, I tried to find for you that in this particular case, he seems to be citing out of Deuteronomy 8. And Deuteronomy 8 is uh, where Moses is bringing the whole command that I command you today. You shall be careful to do it that you may live and multiply and go in and possess the land that the Lord swore to give to your fathers. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you in these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what is in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let, 
you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know. And by the way, the word manna in Hebrew means, what is it? Um, so what they did not know, nor did their fathers know, that he might make you know that man does not live by bread alone. So, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God, of the Lord in, in this case. Um, this appears to be where Jesus is citing Scripture back to the tempter. The question we have, or should have, is why did Jesus choose to use the Bible when the tempter knows he's the Son of God? Why can he not just speak on his own accord? Why is God, what's he thinking? Why is he choosing to cite Scripture rather than relying on his own authority? So he continues in Matthew it goes on to say, but um, then the devil, in five, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written. Now there's an interesting thing, that the tempter now is using the same reference tool, the same scriptures, the same Bible, in order to make his point. He will command his angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. Now this one I found that the devil was using um, Psalms 91. And there you have in verse 11... Um, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways. And on their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against a stone. So it's interesting to me that the tempter believed that Psalms was part of the scriptures that Jesus would consider holy. And we've talked before about the Sadducees and the Pharisees who came into existence in about 167 BCE, that their flavor difference was they didn't agree on what scriptures were, was, was one of the items. Sadducees believe in the writings of Moses, but they would not have regarded this as scripture because it was part of the Psalms. Whereas the tempter and Jesus both accepted Psalms as being scripture. So again, what is God thinking? As the temptation continues, it goes on in seven, and Jesus provides the response. Jesus says to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. So Jesus uses another, it is written. So I went out to try to find, and I think it too is back in Deuteronomy uh, 8, and I think it is um, Deuteronomy 8, no, it's in 6. Deuteronomy 6. Uh, 6, 16. You shall not put the Lord your God to the test as you tested him at Mesa or Massa. Um, you shall diligently keep the commandments of the Lord your God and his testimonies and his statutes which he has commanded you. These, these different references, again, out of Deuteronomy are what God is citing. It is written in order to address the question that was also an it is written. Okay? So the devil used scripture in order to uh, pose a temptation to Jesus. Jesus used Deuteronomy 6 this time in order to respond. In verse 8, it goes on with the devil 
took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to them, all these I will give you if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, Satan. So this is where we have Satan, devil, tempter, all in the same uh, context, storyline. And he goes, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. I had a problem, not with the fact that it is written, but I had a problem finding a Bible text that necessitates or says it really in the same frame. Um, the, the, the best I could come was back into Deuteronomy 6, um, this time at 15. It says, For the Lord your God in your midst is a jealous God, lest the anger of the Lord your God be kindled against you, and he destroy you off the face of the earth. And I have a typo. Um, so again, I don't have where I can um, provide that one I thought was right there. It's not 15, it's 13. It is the Lord your God you shall fear, him you shall serve, and by his name you shall swear. It's not an exact, um, but the idea that the Lord your God is the one that you should fear and serve, it's right here in Deuteronomy 6. I, for the other piece, I went out to 1 Samuel 7 uh, in verses 3 and 4. And this is uh, Samuel. And Samuel said to all the house of Israel, If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the uh, Ashtaroth from among you and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him only and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines. So that is where I found a combination of thoughts. We obviously can go back to uh, the Ten Commandments and try to establish the same, the same pieces uh, that Jesus might have been referring to. And again, I'm doing my searches uh, within the English Standard Version. You may find... Uh, that you can find something closer to what the Lord might have done, uh, might have been referencing, uh, if you were to draft it from the Hebrew itself. Um, although this would be have been written in Greek, so you still got to translate it. Um, so here we have Jesus through his actions um, testifying to the fact that. He relies on what Scripture has already written in the past, that God's messengers have captured God's message, and therefore um, he's using Scripture as his authority. Um, again, as we've discussed, he could have used himself as an authority. He could use the Father told me as an authority. He can say that the Holy Spirit has informed me, but rather than doing that, God has pointed us through his actions to the power and authority of the written word. So, as we continue looking, we want to, uh, the authors wanted us to consider the idea of how Jesus may have considered uh, the written word, specifically the law. And here we have in um, Matthew 5, um, verse 17 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets, but I have, I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. It's an interesting topic of study around the word fulfill um, because many people, theologians alike, believe that if he 
uh, had not come to abolish the law or the prophets, um, fulfilling them, meaning that if they have all come, well, let me back up just a minute. If we take a look at the ordinances that were against us that have been taken down, the, the writings of Moses, the uh, sanctuary sacrifices, the festival days, and yet we have here that Jesus says he came to fulfill them but not to abolish them. So I think we need to be careful as we look at the word fulfill and the word abolish because there are parts of Moses' law that were no longer going to be in play once Jesus um, ascended to heaven. And yet it says he didn't come to abolish it or the prophets. So this is also the place to where uh, the sightings, the sightings, the references uh, from Scripture are not all found in the writings of Moses. And here he expand, expands it out to the writings of Moses, the law, or the prophets, the prophets, your Jeremiah's, your Daniel's, etc., but there are also another section called the writings. It's not mentioned here. Um, but it doesn't mean you have to include everything when the topic of conversation is whether the writings of Scripture have a lasting authority. So the fact that Jesus said they would remain an authority, he came to fulfill them. So if he, his life, his actions as the Messiah were to come in order to fulfill the prophecies that were there through his own study through Scripture, through being led by the Holy Spirit, he often made references to it's not time yet or the time will be fulfilled. And you often wonder, well, did God give him all of this timeline or did he actually study it out for himself from Scripture with the Holy Spirit's um, opening it up. Um, and in 18, it's also important to note, he said, for truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. This gets very, um, very much to the heart of things in that how do you translate a document without changing it by an iota or a dot? Um, so we have to have confidence that the Holy Spirit will preserve the intended parts and forms. We know that, for instance, English has punctuation marks, whereas Hebrew and Greek do not. So these different references to an iota or a dot, these all may be figures of speech, because as you translate it from English or you're, you're trying to read French, or you're trying to read some other translation, they're not going to have all the same dots and iotas. But what is preserved is the authority of Scripture is that changing things deliberately rather than just for a translation. So that's why I've told you that uh, I don't study much from paraphrases, uh, regardless of the source, I try to go to translations because I use Holy Scripture as a, a study document um, more so than as reading material. Um, and 19 really says the piece, therefore whoever relaxes one of these commandments, right? The idea is not the dot or the iota, but the idea of translating and changing. So, this is what's being preserved and should always be preserved in our teachings because those who teach others to do the same will be the least. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So again, as you study, as you learn, and as you have others that want to learn from you, make sure that you keep the intent as best you know it as you teach. All right. Um, 
Matthew 22. Um, this again is how Jesus was using, um, using Scripture. This is the same this is the same conversation, if I go up in Scripture here a little bit, this is the same thing we were talking about earlier, which has the Sadducees came and they asked a question. So then the Sadducees, when they were rebuffed by Scripture, because Jesus said, um, you neither know the Scripture nor the power of God, in speaking to um, the Sadducees about resurrection, However, as soon as that is done, you have that the Pharisees see, the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, so one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. So the Sadducees had their turn, now we're looking at the Pharisees. So again, consistently, we want to see how Jesus continues to point to Scripture. And one of, the, one of them asked him a question. So in 36, it says, Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And he said to him, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind. So, he didn't say, It is written. However, if you continue um, to look for these, you will find that in Again, in Deuteronomy 5, uh, 6, 5, it says, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. So it's interesting that that one, when we were translating uh, Deuteronomy to English and when we were tra translating uh, the Deuteronomy being in Hebrew and we were translating the Greek uh, here, in, here in Matthew, the translations end up being identical. So it is clear that in Jesus' mind, he was providing an it is written. And then he goes on and says, this is, this is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love the neighbor as yourself. And that one, that one is found also um, in the writings of Moses, this time in Leviticus 19, and it says, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. So again, Jesus didn't say it is written in Deuteronomy, it is written in Leviticus, it is written. However, his response is to both the Sadducees and to the Pharisees was directly from Scripture. Now the writings, of, the writings of Ellen White that were referenced uh, by the authors this week, um, they start down here in the corner, I believe, with the Bible is. Um, I want to be able to take you back with a little more of the context in that it says the paragraph starts with Christ's servants are to do the same work in our day, as of old, the vital truths of God's Word are set aside for human theories and speculations. Many professed ministers of the Gospel do not accept the whole Bible as the inspired Word. One wise man rejects one portion, another questions another part. They set up their judgment as superior to the Word, and the Scripture which they do teach rests upon their own authority. Its divine authenticity is destroyed. Thus the seeds of infidelity are sown broadcast, for the people become confused and do not know what to believe. There are many beliefs that the mind has no right to entertain. In the days of Christ, the rabbis put a forced mystical construction upon many portions of Scripture. Because the plain teachings of God's Word condemned their practices, they tried to destroy its force. The same thing is done today. The Word of God is made to appear mysterious and obscure in order to excuse transgression of His law. 
Christ rebuked these practices in his day. He taught that the word of God was to be understood by all. He pointed to the scripture as the unquestionable authority, and we should do the same. The Bible is to be presented as the word uh, of the infinite God as the end of all controversy and the fountain of all faith. The Bible has been robbed of its power, and the results are seen in the lowering of the tone of spiritual life. In the sermons from many pulpits of today, there is not that divine manifestation that awakens the conscience and brings life to the soul. The hearers cannot say, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures. That's the road to Emmaus. The, there are many who are crying out for the living God, longing for the divine presence. Philosophical theories or literary essays, however brilliant, cannot satisfy the heart. The assertions and inventions of men are of no value. Let the word of God speak to the people. Let those who have only heard tradition, heard only traditions and human theories and maxims, hear the voice of him whose word can renew the soul unto everlasting life. All right. That was 40. So we want to take a look at... Jesus and how he related to all Scripture. So as the earlier reference uh, from Christ Object Lessons uh, referred to the road of Emmaus, um, the, the authors took us there as well. We want to understand the idea of how Jesus used Scripture. So you will see a prime example is that every day, um, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? It's interesting that whenever God asks a question, he never needs the answer. So you always want to look at who's in the audience, if you wish. It's kind of like, Adam, where are you? Adam had to realize that he was hiding. God knew not only that he was hiding, but he knew where he was hiding. So whenever God asked a question, he never needs the answer. But someone in the audience that he's speaking needs to know that answer, needs to have a realization, a reality check. So when he asked them what things, and they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet, mighty indeed in word before God and all the people, and, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Let me stop there, because they started now by describing him as a prophet, mighty indeed. He has been demoted. Had you asked him the week before, they might have described him as the Messiah. But now on their walk to Emmaus, he's been demoted to a prophet mighty indeed. Because their expectations of the Messiah was that the Messiah would sit on the throne. In 21, but we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it's now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. 
Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, see, here's where the pivot point came in, in the conversation. We now have Jesus speaking up to those who are trying to put the evidence together according to their own expectations. And he said to them, O foolish ones and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. All that the prophets have spoken. What live prophets have they heard? Possibly John the Baptist. Um, other prophets of the day? Maybe. But that's not the ones that Jesus is really speaking of. He's speaking of the prophets in total. 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, see, he doesn't just, and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. It's interesting that one of the first things that God does after his resurrection in his conversation with those who were believers in him was to point them to the written word, back to scripture. So they, in 28, so they drew near to the village. Well, let, let, let me stop. Even, even before he goes on, he points them to the word. Now remember, he has been disguised. He has been, his, their eyes haven't been opened that he's the Messiah, that he's the risen Christ. He could have just taken the cloak and said, here, see my hand, take my coat off, I'm the same guy, take a look at me. He chose not to do that, he chose to go after Scripture. What's God thinking? Why Scripture? So they draw near the village to where they were going. He acted as if he was going farther. Notice that God can act. So he's an actor in this case. He's, he's asking questions when he already knows the answer. He's um, giving the illusion that he's stepping forward and going beyond. But they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is evening, and the day is, is now far spent. So he went in with them to stay with them. Thirty, when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. This is an interesting, an interesting concept of how do we establish Christ. It is not as though we can ask God to personally show himself today so that we can put our hands in his, we can see his pierced side. That's not the choice that he made. He said, first, go to Scripture. Took them all to Scripture to where they were amazed at how he could open Scripture to them. We can do the same today. We can do the same today. So, um, this is from uh, the writings of the Signs of the Times. Um, and I believe it's uh, back in 1884. She's, she's writing on God's behalf. God is um, stating here that the paragraph begins with, Satan assails another class with arguments that present a greater show of plausibility. Science and nature are exalted. Men consider themselves wiser than the word of God, wiser even than God, and instead of planting their feet on the immovable foundation and bringing everything to the test of God's word, they test that word by their own ideas of science and nature. And if it seems not to agree with their scientific eyes, the ideas, it is discarded as unworthy of credence. Thus, the great standard by which to test doctrine and character is set aside for human standards. This is as Satan designed it to be. 
Some say it is no matter what we believe if we are only honest, but the law and the testimony remain valid, and they are to seek unto them. So we're to, we're to continue to use, uh, I guess the next paragraph says that, the law of God is the great moral standard by which characters to be judged. It's the expression of his will and must be obeyed from the heart. Its holy principles must underlie our course of action in all of our business relations. And I have one more. And it is the... Um, let's see, this is from uh, Fundamentals of Christian Education. Um, the last paragraph starts with, and their sakes, and for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through truth. Teachers may suppose that they can teach in their own wisdom, retaining to their own human imperfections, but Christ, the divine teacher, whose work is to restore to man that which was lost through the fall, sanctified himself for our work. He offers himself unto God as a sacrifice for sin, giving his life for the life of the world. He would have those for whom he paid such a ransom sanctified through the truth, and he has set them an example. The teacher is what he would have his disciples become. There is no sanctification aside from the truth, the word. Then how essential that is it should be understood by everyone. Let's close with a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, thank you so much for sending the Holy Spirit's presence to be with each of the students as they have, uh, as they've watched this presentation. Um, please make us aware of opportunities this week where we can shine and give you the glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now remember, for next week, we have the homework. Um, the uh, next lesson is the Bible, the authoritative source of our theology. And again, intentionally choose to honor God every day this week. Grow, read your Bible, and pray. We don't want to be ever part of those to where we are wrong because we don't know neither the scriptures nor the word of God, power of God. See you next week.